special grace so that I can remember <laughs> from my head some of the things we wanted to talk about. But yesterday we were looking at uh, one heart and one soul. And we had before us the church, the early church in Acts, um, in the book of Acts. And so we looked at a number of things, a number of lessons. We started off by asking what it is that, uh, the reason why we're here. What is the divine purpose? God has a plan and a purpose for each of us to be in this scene, for us to be here. After that we are saved, we come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. The Lord didn't just take us out. He allowed us to continue in this scene. And we noticed yesterday that we are into this new year. We have come even to a new year. And the reason was, why are we here? What's our purpose for being here? And I think as we developed yesterday, that the glory of God should be our all-absorbing object, our desire, that we live here for the glory of God. Now, our topic that we had, we looked at in the book of Acts. We looked at some lessons, and I think there were seven lessons that we learned from the early church. The first lesson, and we had an outline, and the first lesson we noticed was that they uh, prayed together. They were united in prayer. <coughs> And then we noticed that they met at a place. They had a united center, as it were. We had that they were in one place, in one accord. That was in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And then as we go along, we notice that they, had, they were united in place, was the second one. They were united in principle and in practice. And we saw in Acts chapter 2 from verse 44 and so on, where they uh, uh, continued in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and in prayer. And then they were united in practical things, practical uh, 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 fellowship. They took care of the needs of those in the assembly. There was oneness. And then we uh, notice that uh, they were united in the witness and the testimony for the Lord Jesus. And they were united in their purpose. And they were united in their position. And so there were seven things we, we kind of uh, looked at. We were lessons we were learning from, from this early church. Now, there was another united um, position we found, and they were united in prayer and in worship. And so we had that portion in the book of um, Romans chapter 15, and there we read that they had one tongue and with one accord uh, they were glorify God. And I was noticing, I still don't think that's the right one. We're getting <laughs> We were noticing that the portion we have before us has to do with the soul and the spirit. And I was thinking that when we think of the soul and the spirit, it has to do with our desires and with affections, the seat of affection. And I was thinking that our one all uh, desire should be that we are to be here for the glory of God. The other portion we had in our outline is in the book of 1 Samuel. And I want us to turn to the book of Samuel. It speaks of David and Jonathan, that a heart that the souls were knit together. And so, 1 Samuel chapter 18. 
Maybe we could read 1 Samuel chapter 17 for connection. First Samuel chapter 17 from verse 55. When Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said unto Abner, the captain of his host, Whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Enquire thou whose son this stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered him. And then in chapter 18, came to pass, when he had ceased speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garment, even to his sword and to his bow and his belt. And David went out where Sir Saul sent him behaved himself wisely. And then in verse uh, 6, it came to pass when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with timbrels, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women spoke one to another as they played and said, Saul had slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry. And the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me have they ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul watched or eyed David enviously from that day onward. I'm still sure it's not. No, it's not a big. That's it. No, keep going. Nice. It's not a. So. The portion we have before us, I think, speaks eloquently of this other matter. It speaks eloquently of this matter of the affections of the heart. Now, to have a desire to serve the Lord and to be pleasing to the Lord, to live here for his glory, I think is one side. But where does that desire spring from? What's the source of that desire? And I think in this portion we have before us, the Spirit of God would bring before us the affections of the heart. We have here a man, Jonathan. Now, David had won a great victory. Now, this man, Jonathan... He was a warrior himself. The Spirit of God says that after David had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to that of David. 
he loved them. I wonder if Jonathan was the only one in Saul's court. When David came and presented himself to Saul, I wonder of all the other people who saw and heard David speak, who had some knowledge of the victory that David had won. But the Spirit of God says there was one man there who was occupied, not so much with the victory. It's all right to be occupied with the victory. It's all right to speak of the great things that have been done. But the Spirit of God says there was one man there who became occupied with the victor. Often we, we are uh, singing and, and rejoicing in the victory. But we fail to notice, we fail to become occupied with the person. Jonathan represents for us a man who saw, as it were, beyond the victory. He saw the person. Now I began by saying that Jonathan was a warrior himself. Jonathan could appreciate a true victor. Now I wonder if we could turn back quickly in the book of same book of First Samuel, back in chapter 13. In First Samuel chapter 13, we read in verse 3 that Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard it, and saw, blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Here was a great victory for Jonathan. And Saul was, uh, 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 um, he blew the trumpet. He was forefront, as it were, in announcing to all, let all the Hebrews hear. In chapter 14, there was another incident. Remember, it was at Michmash, I believe. In chapter 14, came to pass, verse 1, that upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bore his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. We see that he climbed up on his hands and his feet. It takes labor and prayer. And then we come to verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. And it may be that the Lord may work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So Jonathan was also a man who understood what it is to succeed in the conflict. If you read the rest of the account, we find that they were all trembling and swan in the house, verse 15, and among the people, the garrison, and the spoilers, that uh, they also trembled, and the earth quake, as it were, a great tr trembling. And then when you come to verse 45, the people said to Saul, Jonathan, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? So Jonathan was himself a great uh, 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 victor. He was a man of war. But we read that in this situation with Goliath, if you read the account, 40 days Goliath stood and he defied them. He said, send a man. 
Choose a man. You know, often I says, where was a Jonathan? We, we hear nothing of him. Here we see David coming forth. King Solomon, I mean, King Saul says, who is this stripling? He is unknown, as it were. This poor, unknown shepherd stranger. When he would go to face Goliath, King Saul would put on him all these armors and what have you, coat of maize. And we read that David took them off. He goes with a sling and five smooth stones and a shepherd's bag. And I think Jonathan must have looked at that young man. He saw one who stood where he could never stand. We read that when David came back from the slaughter and David was presented to Saul. And you know, I often wonder that Saul had said to Abner, go and find out whose son he is. And it seems that Abner didn't even bother to check. Because Saul says to him, Whose son art thou? You see, David was unknown to Saul. If we read the account, David had encounters with Saul before. He had played a harp for him. But now he was, as it were, a stranger, a shepherd, unknown. Lowly. His father was unknown. As far as Saul was concerned, he was unacquainted with the father. Whose son are you? But we read that among all those there, Jonathan, his soul became knit to that of David. I want to suggest to you, dear ones, there was affections. David had won a great battle by defeating Goliath and the Philistines. But I think greater still, he had won the heart of Jonathan. You know, it's interesting how the Spirit of God would put side by side Saul's reaction and the Jonathan's reaction. And I wonder if we can trace a little the reaction of Saul and the reaction of a Jonathan to this great victory. Now, for Jonathan, there was no rivalry. I often think he had the greatest to lose, as it were. He was next in line to become king after his father Saul, is it not? His victory, the one in Geba and the one in Michmash, seemed to pale, does it not? In the victory that David had won. It would have been you know, it would have been laughing for Jonathan to go up to David and say, did you hear what I do at, at Geba in the garrison of the Philistines? Or for Jonathan to advertise, did you hear what we did at Michmash? Saul had blown a trumpet after Geba, remember? Let the Hebrews hear. It was known. But what he did pale in comparison for David. No rivalry. 
No seeking to set up self. No self-elevation we find in the reaction of a Jonathan. There was genuine love in his heart. We talk about one heart and one soul. Jonathan looked at David. And there was a reaction. There was a public demonstration. A public display. He wanted to honor David in a way that no one else has. And so this man, Jonathan, he is the son of the king. See him there in his royal robes. See him in all the trappings of the kingdom, as it were. And we read that Jonathan strips himself and he enrobes this David, this poor shepherd boy. He takes off all his kingly apparel. And he puts them on David. He takes his bow and his, his a sword and his girdle. And he gives it to a David. There once it's an expression of emptying of self so that David might be enthroned, so that he might be magnified. What a lesson for us that our true David might be magnified. John the Baptist says, he must increase, but I decrease. There once as he becomes in our estimation, in our eyes. We have sung this morning. Rise my soul. Behold this Jesus. Now in the face of the presence of the Lord Jesus. What it is about. What you have done. Your victory and. And yourself and your place and your position. Jonathan understood a little of this. Jonathan understood in whose presence he was. He is the true victor. Gave him his bow. He gave him his soul. He gave him everything. It is as if he was saying, look, as far as my own defense is concerned. As far as any glory, anything that can be attributed to me. As far as, you know, this royal apparel and all of it. David, it really belongs to you. We read of those who take their crowns. And they cast it at the feet of the Lord Jesus in Revelations. As it were saying, thou art worthy. But you know, I was saying that we, the Spirit of God juxtaposed the David and Jonathan. And Jonathan, it would seem, had the most to lose. But for him, David was not a rival. His heart was one. That's what true affection is. Now, Saul, we read, he also eyed David. But he viewed him with jealousy. He did not view David with adoration as a Jonathan did. He did not see in David, as it were, this great victor. He viewed him with envy. You see, Jonathan speaks of faith, but Saul speaks of the flesh, the activity of the flesh. We can notice quickly Saul 
in verse uh, We have the songs of the women in verse 7. The women spake one to another, chapter 18. Saul had slain his thousands, David his ten thousand. The, it says the saying displeased Saul. Comparison. He is seeing David as a threat. They have given to him, they have ascribed to him ten thousands. They only gave me a small place, a small portion. We have verse 9. Saul eyed or watched enviously David. Then we have Saul seeking to destroy him in verse 11. And then we have in verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. And then in verse 13, Saul removed David from him. This is always going to be the reaction of the flesh. In the presence of the true David, Flesh has no place. Self has no place. There is no place for self-elevation or self-aggrandizement or self-expression. When we're in the presence of our true David, Saul could not, as it were, elevate himself, the flesh, the old man, when David was around. So we read, he removed him. He thrust David away as it were. Relegate him as it were to some other place. And so this is always we find the reaction of the flesh. Two different reactions. One from Jonathan and one from David. I mean Saul. I wanted to touch on a few other things. In this lovely story, we have in chapter 19, verse 4, Jonathan spoke good of David. His speech what he said and what he thought of a David. He spoke well of him. In chapter 20, verse 4. Jonathan said to David, Whatever thy soul desireth, I will do it. Whatever thy soul desireth, I will do. In the same chapter, chapter 20, Verse 34. So Jonathan arose from the table. Remember, this is the incident where uh, 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 Saul cast a javelin. I think in verse 32, we can read. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Why shall he be slain? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him, that's a Jonathan, to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to slay David. 
Now, Jonathan is the king's son. Think of a scene where the father would display for Jonathan. That was an insult. He took a javelin and he would, uh, as it were, kill, slay his son. We read it. Of course, Jonathan is going to be upset. Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger. And I'm thinking, you know, if a father tries to slay a son, surely the son would resent it and be angry, wouldn't he? But let's continue reading. It says that he rose with fierce anger. The end of the clause. For he was grieved for David because his father had done David shame. He didn't think of himself. The father had dishonored him, disrespected him before all in the court. He got up from that table thinking that his father had done David shame. It grieved him. This is a heart that has been won. You know, oftentimes we have the expression that we are here for Christ. And oftentimes what comes to mind is that we are doing things for Christ. We're doing a whole lot. We are engaged in this job and in that job and this activity and in that activity. We are busy for the Lord. But I wonder if the Lord is looking for us to be busy as much as he's looking for our affections and our love. If whatever is done is not springing from a source of deep love and affections there once, it has to spring from another source. There is a whole lot out there that is being done, as it were, for the Christ, in the name of Christ. But I wonder if the Spirit of God is not challenging us this afternoon as we look at this account of a Jonathan. That it is our hearts, it is our affections that the Lord is seeking, as it were, to have a response from. I wanted to read, maybe with very few comments, a couple of portions. Now, what we talked about yesterday, I am thinking of the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, In Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, verse 20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether in life or in death. That Christ might be magnified. We said yesterday our purpose, our desire, is that Christ might be magnified. I think in this first chapter, the Apostle Paul entered a little bit into living here for Christ whether in life or in death. 
that our all-absorbing objective, our purpose might be that he might be glorified, that Christ might be magnified. And it's not a wonderful desire if we leave here together and we say, you know, my object, my all-absorbing object, is that I might magnify Christ in life or in death. Whatever I do, it would be for the glory of our blessed Lord Jesus. But I also want to read a portion in 1 Corinthians. And I wonder if that is not what we have in the story of a Jonathan would bring us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth nothing. There are ones I wonder if the Lord is not saying to us, he's not looking for us to do great things. He's looking for our heart's affection. It's affection for Christ. It's the source and the spring from whatever we do, from which whatever we do should flow. You know, I think in Revelations, in Revelations 2, the Lord writes to the assemblies, the churches in, in the book of Revelations, the first two, cha I mean, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And it's interesting, and I would like to read this portion in Revelations 2 of a church. We have been talking about model churches yesterday, as it were. The, <clears throat> the Lord writes to the church at Ephesus. It says in chapter 2, verse 2, I know thy works, thy labor, Thy patience, how thou canst not bear those who are evil, thou hast tried them, who say they are apostles and are not, hast found them liars. Thou hast borne and have patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and has not fainted. You might say, what a commendation. If as an assembly here at Baltimore or Bethesda, there is such a commendation from the Lord, you might say, this is a model church. We might say, you know, there is so much that's going on, so much activity, so much that is being done for the Lord. They have patience, they have labored, they work for the Lord. You know, but it doesn't end there. The Lord adds, I have verse 4 somewhat against thee. 
because thou hast left thy first love. The Lord sees all the activities and all that's going on. But what about the heart? Jonathan's heart was one. His affections. We speak in our outline of the heart and soul knit together. And we speak of, of oneness. Dear ones, this is not something that can be copied, put on by the mere flesh. This has to be that which is done by the Spirit of God. But it is affections for Christ that I think the Spirit of God would seek to impress in our hearts. It's one thing to be saved. It's one thing to, to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. And thank God for all of us here who know the Lord Jesus as Savior. But what we learn from Jonathan, that it's another thing to empty ourselves. It's another thing to give up all that he might be glorified. And that has to come from the heart. And this is what we see Jonathan doing. He divests himself, take off his robe. And he involves David. Emptied himself. Saul never came to that. Always seeking to elevate himself. Always seeking to make something of self. And we noticed yesterday in our studies, we had the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Of how one would try to make something of himself. But how can that be? How does that help the unity? How does that help this oneness that we're talking about? I said there were two portions I had in Philippians. And so, in Philippians chapter 3, We have <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. What things were gained unto me, those I counted loss for Christ. The things that Solomon, that Jonathan could boast about. His victories, his apparel, his sword, his bow. All the things that maybe he could boast in. That would distinguish him. He said, I count them, but down. He says, I count them, loss for Christ. He says, yea, rather, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Christ becomes his all-absorbing object. 
You know, we had earlier in chapter 1 that in life or in death, he might magnify Christ. But when we come to chapter 3, it is the person of the Lord Jesus who, as it were, attracts his heart, a heart that has been won for Christ. Oh, there are ones this, this year that it might not so much be all the different activities and what's going on around. But that there might be a deepening of our affections for Christ. That we might have a fresh glimpse of this one. Jonathan looked at David and he saw that which attracted his heart. One is affection. We read over and over, he loved him as his own soul. He was willing to give no place to self. He was willing to, at his own expense, at loss to himself, you might say, enthrone a David so that David might be elevated. Oh, that our true David who has done so much for us. We had this morning before us the work of the Lord Jesus. It is his person and his work. They shall forever be our song. When we look at Calvary, and we see the victory that our great David has won for us. How would that not move our lips in worship and in praise and in adoration? But there wants to get a glimpse of this, our true David, to see him. That our affections might be won, our affections might be stirred, our hearts might be touched that we might, as it were, there would be love for him. So as we, we go about this world that we're in, we were saying a few minutes ago that it's not by chance that we are here at this moment, at this place, at this time. God has a divine purpose. And what it is that the Spirit of God would impress on your heart and on mine as we look at a Jonathan and a David. That he is enthroned, self has no place. There has to be an emptying of self, a nothingness of self. And there ones, I dare say, that if we are able to enter a little bit into this, there would be less conflicts. There would be less um, um, disunity amongst us. If there's no place given to self, and Christ is given his rightful place in our affections, then there's going to be a change in our behavior. God grant that that might be so for the glory and for the praise of our blessed Lord Jesus, for his name's sake.